Amen. If that peace doesn't lift your spirits, I don't know what will. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Can you say amen? amen. And um, God is good beyond measure. How thankful we should be as Christian brothers and sisters to know that uh, the Lord is with us. And so, um, before we begin today, we're going to be talking about the parables of the kingdom. This is part number three. But before we begin, let's take a moment and bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we come to you thanking you for Jesus. Thanking you for the pr privilege, for the joy of serving you. And Lord, we ask that as we look at this next parable, the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the parable of the wheat and the weeds, help us, Lord. Help us to understand what you're telling us. Help us to apply the lessons of this parable to our lives. And Lord, send your Holy Spirit to each one. First of all, to the speaker, Lord. I want to speak your words, not mine. And secondly, to those who are listening and those who are watching. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would fill all of us just today, right now. And we ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. The parables of the kingdom. Jesus used parables as examples of his kingdom. And uh, this is part three, the parables of the kingdom. And we're going to look at a very, very important parable. The parable of the wheat and the tares. And this parable is the parable that Jesus explained the most. This is the most commented on parable that Jesus talked about. And therefore, if it was important to him, it therefore should be important to us. Now, um, by way of review, we're, we're going to review just a little bit what we said last week. First of all, what do parables teach us about God? The first thing parables teach us is that of God's condescension. God is teaching us in parables to help us to understand who we are and who he is. His glory and his love, as well as his justice. Secondly, his patience. God is patient with us. Can you say amen? And then God has an extreme desire to communicate with us. And he's using every means he possibly can to reach us. And one of the major means is, of course, the parables. And then he wanted to reveal to us that the creation of the natural world he uses in order to reveal the truths of the spiritual world. The now and the not yet. God is trying to help us through the now and through the natural world to understand more about God. And then there's his desire to be known by all who will make the effort. If we will make the effort, Jesus will reveal himself to us. Can you say amen? We don't want to be lazy about things. We want to be diligent in his word. And then his desire to reveal who he really is through the parables. And then God knows each one of us. God knows our future and our ultimate choice. 
how we're going to choose. And through these stories, he's giving us a little microcosm of the choices that people will ultimately make. We will make choices for the kingdom. And if we choose not to decide, we've made a choice. Can you say amen? Inaction is an action. And so just sitting by and doing nothing is doing something. And then his systematic, predictable, logical nature and methods. God operates in a universe of order. God is a God of order and systematic action. God is not capricious. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, right? I am God and I do not change. So, so God is predictable and therefore we know how God is going to operate because it's been revealed in his word. Can you say amen? Boy, stability is a wonderful thing. And then lastly, his love for his children and for creation. God loves everyone. And God wants to reach everyone, and so therefore he used the parables to do it. Now what about this issue of the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds? Tare is a Old English term that simply means weeds. The parable of the wheat and the tares answers one of the most perplexing questions of unbelievers and the saved alike, that of evil in a world that God intended for good. You know, one radio announcer sent a survey. His name was Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey was a Christian, and he was a frequent reader of Ellen G. White. He sent out a survey over his radio network. And he asked, what is the number one question that people have asked throughout the ages? Anyone know what the question was? If God is so good, why is there evil in the world? That's the number one question. Good God, bad world, why? Many Christians ask this, when things happen in our lives, we ask, why God? When tragedy comes, people ask, why? In the church, out of the church, religious, irreligious, atheist, agnostic, whatever you may be, the question has risen at some time, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? And why do bad things happen to good people? So I believe the parable of the wheat and tares is very, very important in this respect. It helps to give us a perspective. It pulls the curtain back. It gives us a view, a glimpse of what's really happening. So if you turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 13, we'll begin with verse 24. And I want to read this parable, and then we're going to get into some of the details. And then we're going to go to Jesus, and we're going to let Jesus interpret this parable for us. Do you know that the parable of the wheat and the tares is a prophecy? Now, the Bible tells us that no prophecy is what? Is of any private interpretation. So, therefore, this prophecy is going to be solved, not by Pastor Verse, but by the Master himself. Verse 24, notice with me. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying... The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed seed in his field. His field. 
Singular possessive pronoun, his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares or weeds among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares or the weeds also. How many here have gardened? If you've gardened, raise your hand. Now, when you garden, it's a lot of work, isn't it? Oh, man. I decided one year I was going to garden. Man, I got out there. It was July. It was hot. Oh, man, was it hot. And the, the garden was probably 500 feet from the house because you want the garden away so that you can have that divided area so that animals or whatever don't get into your garden. And just getting water out there was a chore because I had to string a hose and all of that and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of work and effort that's put into the harvest, right? And so Jesus is telling the story to help us to understand what effort he is putting into this world. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus is invested. Are you invested? Jesus. So he plants all these good seeds and then all of a sudden these nasty weeds get into the field. And so the servants of the householder came to him. These are the workers. They were working the field. They were taking care of the field. And then they go to the master and they say, Master, they ask the question, this question that Paul Harvey put out, did you not sow good seed in your field? You told me that you're good. You said that you're a God of love. You said that you intended the world to be good. But why is it bad? Why is there problems in my life? I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to do right. Why? Anyone here have little grandchildren or children? How many times do you hear the word why? Why is this? Why is that, Mom? Why is this? And then, of course, as, as parents, we try to answer all of it, and then eventually we say, because. So the workers in God's field is asking, why, God? See, it's natural to ask why. Why? And when my children were growing up, I never tried to stifle their questions. Sometimes they would drive me crazy. You know what I'm talking about. Well, why is this? Why is this? Why is this? God is going to answer that question for us. God is going to tell us. He's going to tell us in his word. Jesus is going to tell us why things are the way they are. Verse 28, he said unto them, an enemy has done this. See, somebody else has come into the picture. It's not God that's responsible for death and dying and pain and separation and 
divorce and pain and dying and disease. God is not responsible. An enemy has done this. See, it all lays at the doorstep of someone else. But you know, the sad part is God is always blamed, isn't he? Your roof gets blown off, it's an act of God. You go to some evangelical funeral, God wanted him up there, he took him. Never mind that the guy smoked uh, 15 cigarettes every half hour. All the natural consequences take people. God is blamed. See, an enemy has done this. And God's going to tell us who this enemy is. We don't have to guess. Jesus is going to interpret this parable for us. The servant said unto him, Will you that we go and gather them up? Get them weeds. Let's go into the garden and rip those weeds up. Let's make the world right. I'm going to take it on my own initiative to straighten things out. I know how things work. How often do we do that on our own initiative? See, we think we're wise. I'm just going to do this action, and it will take care of the problem. Oh, when I was a young man, starting out in ministry, I saw something. I'll take care of that. I march over there, and boom, I blow the whole thing up. Ignorant youth. But notice what Jesus said. He said, but he said, no, don't do that. Unless while you're gathering up the weeds or the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Ooh, ooh. What is he saying here? He's saying many times our action can cause detriment in the lives of those who are his children or the wheat. He's going to define who the wheat is here. God is too wise. See, sometimes we want to jump to action. I know how to solve this. I'll just do this. Now, does that mean that there should be no activity? I don't believe so. In Scripture, we have guidelines on how we deal with tares or weeds. There are guidelines. But... God is cautioning us here to be very careful and highly consider and pray about the things that we do or we do not do. Can you say amen? In verse 30, let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to who? The reapers. Gather Together first the what? The tares or the weeds. And bind them in bundles to be what? To be burned or to burn them. So now let me ask you, are the weeds going to be taken care of? Ultimately. See, many times we think about just now. We think about my pain and my emotion just now. 
God is thinking about the long term eternity. See, eternity is God's concern. God has two objectives. Number one is the wheat, saving the wheat. Because the tares going to be dealt with. Did he not say? They'll be gathered in bundles to be burned. So God's going to take care of the tares. His major consideration is the wheat and eternity. See, we think about the now. God is thinking about the not yet. And God is saying, be patient about things. Because there are things in the background that you don't know. And we're not done yet. We're going to talk about how all these things work here. The now and the not yet. We're so focused on the now. I got to solve this problem now. I got to have this now. I want this now. Give me this now. And God is saying, be patient. The Bible says, like the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the ground. He says, wait. Take a break. See, inactivity does not necessarily mean neglect. There are things that happen in our lives, and there are circumstances so complicated that only God can solve the problem. And, and by my meddling and getting in the middle of it, I make it even worse. And I cause pain and suffering. Or maybe I judge people and say, they should be doing this. They should be doing that. They should be doing this. When we don't know. Be careful. Be careful how we deal with people. He said he'd gather them to be burned. It's payday someday. Nobody's getting away. And all of us, we can think back in our minds when there's been a time when people have gotten away. People are not getting away. One day, it's all going to be made right. Can you say amen? amen? The Bible says, do not take revenge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Be patient. I will repay. And it seems like people are getting away with everything today no they're not it just seems that way be patient brethren unto the coming of the Lord who will give every man his reward according to his work so who's going to repay but they get away They've hurt me. I've hurt for years. God, why don't you answer me? Why don't you give me what I want? God says, be patient. Be patient. Now, Jesus is going to define this parable for us. But I want to talk with you about the weed. The weed that is spoken of here was what is known today as the bearded darnel or the false wheat. And that when the darnel is starting to grow, it looks just like wheat. Here is a picture. 
you can see here the actual wheat and you can see the, the darnel. Can you tell the difference? See, but the grain of the darnel, unfortunately, even though it looks just like wheat, it's actually poisonous. William Barclay, in his commentary, put it this way. It says that it causes dizziness and sickness and is narcotic in its effect. And even a small amount has a bitter and unpleasant taste. And, and this darnel looks just like wheat until the harvest. It grows bigger and taller than regular wheat. See, the weeds always stick out. See, and in the end, in the end, in Palestine, when they harvest the wheat, the Darnell has to be separated by hand. Because what it does, the Darnell weed combines its roots with the roots of the wheat. And when the wheat is pulled up or the Darnell is pulled up, it will uproot the wheat as well. And so what they have to do in order to not destroy the wheat plant, each individual Darnell has to be dealt with. A worker has to go and he has to work so carefully around the roots. And he has to take the individual roots and he has to pull them apart in order to save the wheat. See, it's not so easy, is it? See, we think we know, but we don't know. We don't know what's going on in people's lives. We're not mind readers. Now again, we're not talking about inaction here. And later on, we're going to talk about how do we deal? How do we work with people that have gone astray? The Bible tells us. So the Darnell. Now let's, let's go back to verse 36. Jesus is going to interpret this parable for us. Notice with me. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. This is 36 of Matthew chapter 13. And went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying... Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Notice what they mentioned. They said the tares of the field. So they were interested in the weeds. Have you heard the expression getting off in the weeds? See, it's human nature to want to correct everything. It's human nature to put things in order. To do things right. And we should. Don't misunderstand. The Lord is a God of order and of structure. I believe that. I know that. I've learned that. But also God is a God of patience and of love and of deference. So he answered. Who's he? Who's he? Who answered? Jesus, we're talking about Jesus now. We are not interpreting this parable. Jesus is interpreting it because I'm giving you the interpretation right now. He answered and said unto them, he that sowed the good seed is what? Son of man. Okay. So who sows the good seed? Jesus. The word of God. And of course, throughout the scripture, the word of God is compared to seed. We just looked at the previous parable, right? 
So God is sending forth his word, his three angels' message, his everlasting gospel to the world. That's what the Bible's saying. So God intended the world to be good. Can you say amen? God did not want the circumstances that we have today. He answered and said unto them, He that sowed the good seed is the Son of Man, Jesus. Verse 38. The field is what? The world. How many fields are there here? Is there two? One field. The field is the world. So, the field is the world. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye into all the world. Everywhere the, the word of God is to go and the church is to do that, right? Acts of the Apostles, page 9. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men, right? Organized for service to bring the gospel to the world. The world. Our responsibility is the whole world. Can you say amen? Everywhere. We're to reach everybody. The field is the world. The good seed are what? The children of the kingdom. Or the wheat, right? The wheat is the good. Right? Am I interpreting that correctly? Okay, good. Keep your pastor in line here. Don't let me go off. But... Coordinating conjunction conditional clause, okay? For those English teachers. But means the second clause changes the first clause, right? But, coordinating conjunction. But, this world is good and God has all these good people and... He intended it to be good, but. I wanted to give you this, but. Changes. The whole world changed. God's intentions were good, but somebody else changed it. People are changing it every day. What God intended for good, the devil is working for the bad. And men are working for the bad. And men are choosing the bad. And women are choosing the bad. Mm. Then he goes on, but the tares are the children of who? The wicked one. The wicked one. Now, is the church in the world? Okay. Now, he didn't say the church. He didn't say the field is the church. He said the field is the world. So these circumstances will exist in the world. And in the church. Okay? You agree with me? There's going to be hypocrites everywhere. There's hypocrites in business. There's hypocrites in industry. There's hypocrites in the church. Hypocrite comes from the word hypocrisis. It means the one with two faces. That's what the Greek means. Has two faces. See, the tares actually try to be wheat. And many times the tares 
look just like wheat. And many times the tares act like wheat. As a pastor, as elder, you have to be very careful. Because many times the people that you think are wheat may actually be tares. And many times you think of the people who are tares may actually be wheat. You don't know. Why is Jesus telling us this? He's trying to help us to understand that it's his kingdom, not ours. This church does not belong to Pastor Verse. It doesn't belong to the elders. It doesn't belong to this congregation. You know who it belongs to? God. We answer to God. And our actions and the things we do concerning the lives of people, we have to be very careful. Jesus said in Matthew 18, be very careful if you offend one of these little ones who believe in me. It's better that a mulos lithos or a millstone be put around your neck and you be cast into the sea. The mulos lithos. The mulos lithos was a large stone that was used to grind the wheat and the donkeys would pull or the oxen would pull it and then the, the, the mulos lithos would grind over the wheat and it would bust the wheat apart so that the chaff could be blown away and the good part of the wheat kept. Jesus said, be careful how you judge people. You don't know. <clears throat> so what about it, God? When is something ever going to happen? Notice with me. In verse 40. No, excuse me, verse 39. The enemy that sold them is what? Who is it? So who's responsible for death and dying and pain and disease and all that? The devil. The devil. The opposer. The one who ruined everything. The one who is ruining people's lives today. If not by his direct action, though the actions of demons, but by the choices of men. The choices we make in our life determine whether the devil's active or inactive. And then sometimes even when we want to do everything we know to do, the devil's still active. Who is it? The enemy that sold them as who? Is my brother-in-law? It's the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but of principalities and powers in high places. So my mother-in-law is not necessarily the problem. Or my ex-husband is not the problem. The enemy that sold them is the devil. But when, Lord? When are you going to straighten this stuff out? I can't hardly take it anymore. I've been through this for years. Be patient, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. 
Ask God, pray to God, talk to God, agonize with God. There's been times and in, in circumstances in my life I've had to throw myself on the floor and cry out to God for help. Have you experienced that? Have you had such pain in your heart you thought you were going to die? God knows. God knows. And, and, and sometimes we got to live by faith and we got we to gotta ask God to help us to have the patience because what we need is to develop characters. And some of these characters in our lives help us to build character. Not because God wants it, but we live in a fallen world. And people make choices and they do things that hurt themselves and they hurt others and they hurt us. The harvest is the end of the world. Oh, but we say, God, I can't wait. God has promised. There's no temptation that you have experienced that is not common to man. But God in his divine wisdom will make a way of escape so that you may bear up under it. Modern translation. Does God know? God knows. God knows. He feels. He sees, he loves, and he hurts. God hurts with us. God knows what you're going through. So when, Lord? When will it happen? Now, does God always wait forever? No. God's divine hand moves every day. Why does he not move in my circumstance or your circumstance? I don't know. But God does. That's why we trust him. That's why we pray to him. That's why we, we put our lives into his hands because he can be trusted. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. God doesn't lie to us. God tells us the truth. And most of the time we don't even want to hear the truth. Heard the old expression, truth hurts. And honestly, if we looked at our lives, there's a lot of mistakes that we've made. But God is ever so loving and ever so forgiving. And God wants us to learn to be like him. And many times going through these tragedies, this pain, God doesn't want it, but God can use it. Oh man, some of, the, some of the worst pain I've experienced in my life, looking back on it, I'm so glad it happened. Because it made me who I am. The choices I've made, I've suffered for. See, tribulation worketh patience, the Bible says. So therefore, what does he say? The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are who? Who's going to do the reaping? Is it the elders? Is the elders going to do the reaping? Is sister so-and-so going to do the reaping? Is brother so-and-so? Is, is the family that controls the church going to do it? No, the angels are going to do it. Let's get perspective here. We don't own anything. We are stewards. We are God's good stewards. And God in his good time will reveal. And we're going to talk about how, how, how do we know God's leading in our lives. There are some indicators how do we know when we're to move as a church body? God will show us. 
There are ways in which the church should operate. There is gospel order. We're not talking about that. We're talking about having the individual patience that God wants us to have. Can you say amen? Man, there's things that have come out of my mouth that I regret. Now, if you've had things come out of your mouth that you've regretted, can you raise your hand, please? Okay, come on, be honest. Raise them hands up. See, we need to have patience. Patience is a virtue. So, who's going to be the reapers? The angels. As therefore the tares are what? Gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be when you die. No. When is it? In the end of this world. There's no false doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Everybody gets payment at the same time. The harvest is the end of the world. That's what the Bible teaches. So when is everything going to be made right? The end of the world. That's what the Bible teaches. Be patient, brethren. So how's he going to do it? Notice with me. Verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth who? His angels. Who's going to go? Is it going to be the saints? No, the angels. The angels. And they shall do what? Gather out of what? Whose kingdom? So, so is there people that are in his kingdom that are offensive? Ooh. So are there people in the church that are doing dirt? Ooh. Are there people in the world that are doing dirt? Are people seeing it? Do you realize it? The church is not a mausoleum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. The church is the place where people come to God. The church is the place where people who have imperfections come and find Christ. The church is the place where people who are weak come to be strong. The church is the place where, where people who don't know can learn. The church is the place where people that do wrong can learn to do right. He should know better. I had one elder come to me in one of my churches and he said, Pastor Verse, you know what? I said, what? He said, I've been in the way for years. And I said, yes, brother, I believe that. Should we expect people to know? Should we not have a means by which people to grow? Should the church not have a way in which to help people to learn of Christ? Should the church not be the place where the desperate sinner can come and find Jesus? Should the church not be the place to where people can be comforted and to know that God will hear them? If you've lived any time at all, you know the good always comes with the bad. It's a matter of focus. What are we focusing on? 
Oh man, I want everybody to come here. I want everybody in this whole community to come. I don't care if you smell like alcohol, you're welcome here. I don't care if you do drugs, you're welcome here. I don't care if you've had a criminal past. I don't care if you come here. Because Jesus wants everybody. Now, yes, we have expectations. We expect you to act decent. Yes. And we will help you over these things. And so God wants everybody in his kingdom. And when these new people come in, it's tough, man. Because they do things and they say things and they act like things. And, and it's hard on us. But we got to realize what we're here for. We're not here together, everybody who's like us. We're here because God wants to reach the people of this community. Can you say amen? That's why I'm here. See, because I was one of those people. I was a godless atheist that hated Christianity. And only thing that woke up my heart was the love of God that was revealed in his people. It wasn't the doctrine. It wasn't argument. See, I could argue against those things. But when I saw the life of the precious people who loved me and said, Steve, I care about you. Steve, why don't you come over for fellowship dinner? Steve, why don't you come to my house? Steve, why don't you do this with us? Why don't you care about? And man, I couldn't deny it. And the sweet experience of some of those people, they were so loving and they were so caring. And they loved me. That's what the church is about. Yes, God's going to take care of all this stuff. That's why we go to him every morning. I say, Lord, oh, every situation, every person. And if you notice, I always pray. I pray with each one of you. Because I don't want to do anything that God doesn't want me to do. And I'm going to confirm that because I'm going to go to him and I'm going to ask him, Oh God, give me the wisdom. Give the elders the wisdom. Give us the wisdom. Because I don't want to turn one away. And I want to give that terror, that person that seems to be the devil. I want to give them just the right opportunity that God wants them to have. I want them to see the love that God wants them to see. Because they may change. Just like I changed. I became different. Because of his love. God's love changes people's hearts still today. And they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. All things. How many things? All things. Some things, a few things, only what I like. All things. One day, it's going to all be over. One day, all this pain that you've experienced is going to be over. One day, all the separation and the hurt and the pain is going to be over. One day, Jesus is coming, and Jesus is coming for those who are waiting for him. And Jesus is coming for that precious wheat that suffered for years. Now, can I tell you why? I don't know. But I know that God can be trusted, that God tells us the truth about ourselves and about others. See, some of us need a good dose of truth. Not necessarily from our fellow man, but from God. Does God talk to you? Are you talking to him in the morning? Are you listening to him? Is he conversing with you? Is he running your life? See, he loves the precious fruit of the ground. But you know, 
He also loves the weeds. See, at one point, I was a weed. I was a weed that was going to be pulled up by the roots. I was a weed that would have been discarded and thrown on the pile, on the compost pile. I was a weed that would have been burned. But God's patience and his love and the patience and love of his saints redeemed the sinner. Oh, man. Are you redeemed? Did God redeem you? Think back. How did I used to be? And then look over. Look over at that saint next to you, that saint in front of you. And sometimes even look at that saint that you're in conflict with. Look at that brother-in-law. Look at that Wife, look at that husband, look at that cousin, look at that enemy. Can God do for them what he did for you? Is it possible? Is it possible you may be the agent that God may use to pluck that brand from the fire? Is it possible? I don't know. Only God knows. See, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that are thin. See, one day the church is going to be cleaned up. So you better be careful about cleaning the church. Because maybe we may be one of the ones cleaned up or wiped out or bundled to be burned. Be careful. All things that offend and coordinating conjunction again, two clauses hooked together, them which do Iniquity, anomia, lawlessness. So are the criminals on Wall Street getting away? No. Is the Republican Party getting away with it? Is the Democratic Party getting away with it? Nobody's getting away. One day, it's all going to be taken care of. Can you say amen? We don't have to worry. God's going to take care of it. And when, when God does things in his way, it's always the best way. Can you say amen? Have you experienced that in your life when you waited on God and you let God deal with things? Has it been better? Amen. Oh, and just think about it. And I was so saddened about this next part. I really was. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Oh, my goodness. The wicked are going to pay. That person that we hate is going to pay. Nobody's getting away. God extends forgiveness to the whole world. Jesus died from the foundation of the world, but there's coming a time, there's coming a day when everybody will receive their reward, whether it be good or whether they be evil. That's what the Bible promises. Give me just a moment. I want to talk about weeds. 
Okay, what is a weed? A weed is a plant that is growing where it is not wanted. Secondly, a weed is a plant out of place. You know, some animals eat weeds and they can be sustained upon weeds. So weed is simply a plant where it should not be. And then it's a plant that is growing where it is desired that something else grow. So sometimes weeds are actually useful. Weeds can have a function. And then these plants with harmful or objectionable habits. Sometimes they, they will crowd out the other plants. Sometimes they will inject poisons in the ground that will destroy the other crop. So let's look at some characteristics of weeds. I did some extensive research in preparation for this, uh, and I read several, several articles just about weeds. Because I wanted to know. I wanted to know what Jesus is really saying here. Now, first of all, weeds multiply faster than wheat, usually up to 20 times faster. So if you've got one weed, if you let it go, it will multiply. I noticed in the garden, when I did my garden, man, those weeds. I just, one day I'd go out there and pull them all out, and the next day there's more again. So weeds are going to be persistently with us. Okay? Weeds multiply more. Now, that's not the only thing problem with weeds. Weeds consume much more nutrients than the wheat does. They eat up the resources. Now, those who are pastors and, and elders, you know what I'm talking about. A weed can start a controversy in the church and just suck up all the resources. They can eat up the pastor's time. They can eat up the elder's time. I'm talking plain now. They'll consume up the resources of the church. Now, balance that with what Jesus said now. Weeds are more resistant to ill effects than wheat. The things that would kill the wheat don't kill the weeds. Now, now they have a pesticide called Roundup, uh, the gluco, I forget what exactly the name is, and I'm going to talk about that in just a, just a moment, where they spray all the field and it kills everything but what has the Roundup embedded in the seas. It's been genetically modified. Weeds, if left unchecked, will destroy much of the crop. So weeds have to be dealt with. The issue isn't should weeds be dealt with. The issue is who deals with the weeds. Okay? Okay? And I've seen it, I'm, I'm going to be totally honest with you, I've seen it where that if, 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 if circumstances get so bad, but if God's people are praying, God will move his divine hand to deal with issues. So God's in control of his church. Don't you worry about that. God's going to take action when it's time to take action, and he'll show the leadership how to do it. Can you say Amen. So we're not running around leaderless here. God's in control. Can you say amen? Weeds tend to be spiny, noxious, or poisonous to the crop. Boy, if this don't <laughs> describe some of the tears. 
just nasty. People can sometimes be nasty and defiant and pushy and got their own agenda and they'll, they'll just wreck everything. God will deal with it. We'd survive on little resources when the crop is dead. Have you noticed that? Have you seen churches that have gone down and then all's left is the weeds? Weeds hang on, man. They want to kill because then they can take over. Weeds will only grow in good soil. If soil goes bad, guess what? Weed doesn't grow. It only grows in good soil. So in other words, the devil is going to, apply to try to plant weeds in our good soil. And by the bare fact that we have weeds, do we have weeds? Do we have weeds? Yes, we do. Weeds are going to be with us till when? Till the end of the world. Okay? Now, I'm not judging anybody. I'm simply saying that the concept of the weed is with us. So we have to understand how things work. We have to un understand how we go to God about weeds in our personal lives and in our corporate church life. Can you say amen? Weeds will only grow in good soil. Now, how many have heard of Monsanto? This is going out over the airwaves. My personal opinion is that Monsanto and the whole biotechnology world is detrimental to the human race. They have learned to manipulate the plants to make money. They have learned to destroy the vital nutrients and elements. Elements of the earth in which to produce money. Monsanto is all around us. They, they were just sold, by the way. And these are all the interconnected companies that Monsanto, DuPont, and the other chemical companies who are all working together to genetically modify the food, the wheat, in order to make money. See, Monsanto and all the rest are attempting to kill the weeds. And all they're ending up doing is killing everybody. Be careful about the weeds. We make such snap judgments. Just Get the weeds. See, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Now, why? Why does, why does God allow the weeds to apparently grow uninhibited and destroy the good name and reputation of the church? Why? Why does a good God allow evil to exist in his church? Have you asked that question? Notice with me. Adam and we as individuals choose a life of sin. Number one, we choose to have weeds in our lives because of what we do. 
And God is a God that is so fair, he's so even-handed that he allows people to choose. He tells us, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, but some of us will marry unbelievers and we will suffer. God tells us how we should eat, but we choose to eat differently. Our choice. We choose the wrong. And God will never violate our freedom to choose. Can you say amen? You know, just think about it. Even when we're sinning, God continues to let our hearts beat. God could stop it. Weeds. Secondly, God has by his nature placed limitations on himself and his people that the wicked do not have. See, God only fights fair. God operates within the principles of integrity. The wicked do not. Christians in principle act in principle. Unbelievers and apostates do not. And so God and the church has to deal with all this underhanded nonsense that sometimes goes on. People don't fight fair. I'm being plain now. In dealing with the wicked, some of the saved would be lost. God does not want to lose a single soul. Can you say amen? Oh man, God says, I'm going to put up with a lot of nonsense in order to have my people saved. Are you willing to put up with nonsense to see people saved? Oh man, it's starting to get hot in here, isn't it? See, God doesn't want anyone to be lost. And so therefore, by the fact that we live in an evil world, God has to put up with nonsense. But one day, it's all going to end. Can you say amen? It's not going to be like this forever. Jesus is coming again. God himself is on trial. All the accusations against God. Have you ever had to go to court? Man, when I get a traffic ticket and I go in there, I hate it. Because the peering eyes of the the judge and the magistrate and they're asking all these questions and it's unnerving, isn't it? Just imagine God and his very character. The thing he cares about most is on trial. Every day, every hour, every decision, every word that comes out of the mouth of the Christian, God is on trial. And we act so haphazardly and we act like, oh, it really doesn't make a difference. Yes, it does. What I say and what I do can cost people their eternal life. I'm talking to me. Remember, the Lord dealt with me before he dealt with you here. As I found these things, I, I had to go, man. I had to go and I had to think about it. Oh, oh, oh God, help me. Help me not be, be, be wrong with anybody. Help me to do the right thing, Lord. Please help me. Help me. Saying God's not only on trial, his people are on trial. Mm, mm, mm. 
In the course of interaction with the weeds, God's people are fitted for everlasting life. So that weed that's in your life, or that perceived weed, may be the means by which God reaches your heart. Can you say amen? Oh, boy, it's different now, isn't it? I'm talking about weeds. I'm talking about the effect of weeds. These people, these people that we can't stand. These people that have made our lives hell. These people that have cost me. These people that have hurt me. Can God actually be using them? Yes. Emphatically, yes. Finally, God will deal with all sin and sinners. Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Oh, his kingdom's coming. And it's, it's even closer than it ever was. We're close to the kingdom. Jesus is coming again. And the inconveniences and the hassles and the nonsense that we go through with those rebellious ones and the ones that cause us pain. It's going to be over. It's going to be over and we don't ever want to look back. I don't want to look back and say, Lord, I did the wrong thing. I, why couldn't I be more patient? And when we stand on the sea of glass, some of those ones that we hated so bad will either be there or not be there. I don't know. I don't run your life. I don't want to. I don't want to tell you what to do. But I know that if we trust God, that everything's going to work out. Can you say amen? amen. Everything is going to work out. Oh man, I trust God and I know that he's going to do the right thing. He's going to do the right thing. So, does God have a response for the tares? For those? There's no better scripture than Psalms 49. Psalms 49 is concerning the wicked. I've got two slides left, but I want to read Psalms 49. So, if you'll turn over there with me. I believe this is God's answer for the wheat and the tares. And this is God's word that's speaking to us. Psalm 49, verse 1. Hear this, all ye people. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, both rich and poor, together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a parable. I will open my dark sayings upon the harp. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquity of my heels shall surround me? They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitudes of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious. And it ceases forever that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth the wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call lands after their own names. Sound familiar? Nevertheless, man being in honor abides not. He is like the beasts that perish. This their way is their folly, yet their prosperity approve their sayings. 
Like sheep they are laid in the grave. That shall feed on them, and, up, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. For he shall receive me. Be thou not afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and men praised him. When thou doest well to thyself, he shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understands not, is like the beast that perish. So what's the fate of the wicked? The fate of the wicked is the last thing. The fate of the wicked is grave. The fate of the wicked is not everlasting life. So can we hold on? Can we hold on, Christian? Can you wait? Can you talk to God about the problems and the trials that you have and let him take care of your life? God will take care of the wicked just as he will take care of the righteous. Then continuing, Psalms 50 is actually part of Psalms 49. Let me finish it here. Notice with me, Psalms 50, verse 1. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. And he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, he says, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Oh, it's coming, folks. God's kingdom is coming. The king is coming. This is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. So which are you? Who are you? Are you the wheat that's going to be gathered in to the barn of the Savior, to his everlasting kingdom, the kingdom that will never end? Or are you a tear whose life will be like a vapor that will be consumed with the fire of eternity. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the parable of the wheat and the tares. Oh God, be with us. Help us to transcend this world. Help us to transcend the personal hurts that we have in our lives. Help us to turn on our love for those who even hate us. Oh God, give us the supernatural presence of your spirit. Oh God, we don't have the ability. We feel so bad. We've been hurt, Lord. We've, it's been unjust. It's not been right. 
but help us. Help us, Lord. Help us to be ready for your kingdom. And Lord, maybe there's that one right now. Maybe there's someone that's been a tear in your life. Maybe there's been that someone that's made it hell for you. Maybe there's that one that you have such bad relationship with that it bothers you every day. Oh God, take, take those feelings away. Lord, send your spirit. Send your spirit into our lives and forgive us, Lord. Forgive me. And Lord, you promised in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But Lord, they're getting away. No, they're not. They won't have eternity. They won't be there with you for eternity. They won't be in the gates and in the place of heaven. They won't inhabit the earth. Everyone will pay. So Lord, give us that love that only you can give. And Lord, take away that pain as only you can take. And bless us, Lord. And Lord, just now we ask you to forgive us of our wrongs. Take the wrong actions and the wrong thoughts and the wrong deeds that I've done and cast them into that sea of forgetfulness. So Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, you've forgiven me by faith, not because circumstances have changed, not because things are necessarily different, but because you've said so. And Lord, we can be free. We can be free just now from the guilt of the past and from the problems of the past. So bless us to this end, Lord. Give us a new heart, we pray in Jesus' name. May God bless you and may God keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and to give you peace. God bless you.